right. Good morning, Antioch Church. Let's find our ways to our seats. Actually, let's stay standing and sing hymn number 516, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work, work under the, uh, sorry, road is called up yonder, I'll be there. We know this part. When the road is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Amen. Woo! When our work on earth is done, is what I was trying to say. Aren't you glad when our work on earth is done, we're going to be in glory? Amen. We've got a few announcements this morning. First of all, I want to say a huge thank you to our awesome worship leader, Dewey Partouche, and my main man, the enforcer, Dave McLean. They were here until 11 o'clock last night setting up this brand new digital soundboard so the sound is better our online sound will be better can we just say thank you to them for their dedication and we've been rewiring and reworking some stuff so this morning we're going to work the kinks out amen all right nothing like on the job training praise the lord today if you are brave enough we are going to do some river baptisms down by the river after the 11 a.m service uh, down by the hardware river up the street so if you're brave enough i'm so glad for Penny Martin and her family, she couldn't wait. We did seven baptisms at their pool before I left for Malaysia. Praise God. We still have some more to be baptized. So if you are brave enough, we will do that today. Our fall festival is November 2nd, and we are still in need of volunteers. Contact the church office and let us know how you're going to help us reach our community with the love of Jesus. It's our biggest event of the year, and we still have a lot of places for you to serve. Uh, Christmas play practice for speaking parts will happen on Sunday, November the 10th, right after the second service. There will be lunch and snacks. Pastor Dave might stay, even though I don't have a part. Lunch and snacks just speak to me. Praise God. We are collecting items for the children's Christmas shop. You can put your donations in the Boomer classroom in the chapel. Ladies, you have two opportunities for Bible study, 10 a.m. on Sunday, not on Sunday, 10 a.m. on Thursday in the Boomer Yaw classroom, or you can meet at Nancy Kidd's house at 6.30 p.m. Ladies, get involved. The directory picture signups are on the back table. We would love to have a nice, beautiful, brand new photo of your beautiful family to put in the updated directory. Sign up for a table. Those pictures start next Sunday. We're having our very merry, joyful noise celebration on December 1st from 3 to 5. If you would like to sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord, please contact Paula Aldridge. We're also collecting items for the Christmas gift collection for the Flumana Correctional Women's uh, Center for Women, the Women's Prison. You can put those items at the back of the Worship Center. We're also collecting for Operation Christmas Child. There's a side table here. You can get all your information for that. We're trying to do a record number of boxes this year, praise God, for the Hope Backpacks that are going to be going out in the coming weeks. And we're already gearing up to give also for Christmas. Amen. Our Shield of Badge officers are Deputy Eric, is, is Deputy Eric Bryan from the Fluvanna County Sheriff's Office. Keep that Deputy Bryan in your prayers. And as always, please remember to pray for our men and women in law enforcement that are keeping us safe. Amen. And if you have any needs or concerns or problems, the Deacons of the Month are Trix Hazlip and Justin Sorrell. So they're looking forward to your call. Let's bow our heads and pray and let's get into our time of worship. Heavenly Father, it is so good to be back in your house. 
Lord, we just praise you and thank you for all that you've done. Lord, we thank you that you have brought us back to life, that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. Lord, we just pray that you will quicken us today as we worship your name. Meet every need, meet every person right where they are with the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Let's worship. Before you run off too far, <laughs> it's the last, I'm pretty sure it's the last weekend of, of Pastor Appreciation Month. Like, I don't know about y'all, but I've been blessed to have the whole family in my life. You know, we just want to, we got a little something for everybody in the family, man. Bro, we love you. If you get a chance, talk to Dave, let him know how much y'all love him and appreciate everybody in the family.
this morning we're gonna do a new song it's called back to life and it's hard to like get into a song that you haven't heard before so i understand that but i encourage you to just listen to the words and really um try to worship through that um new confusion so no longer i live the christ in me for i've been Oh, 
Jesus, I'm so thankful that we don't have to stay dead in our sins, God. I'm so thankful that you breathe life into us. And this morning, God, as we give our tithes and our offerings and we worship you, Lord, I just pray that we would really rest in the fact that we don't have to stay dead in our sin, God, that we can put that down and we can move forward in you, Lord. In your name I pray. Seated above, throned in the Father's love, destined to die.
praise you and thank you that we can overcome because you overcame. Oh, we praise you and thank you, God, that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you because you were given the name that is above every other name and at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and now we can overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the completed work of salvation on the cross and by the word of our testimony that what you did before, oh God, you will do it again and you're no respecter of persons. So what you did for one, you will do for another. And Lord, you have made salvation available to all who call on the name of the Lord and they shall be saved. Help us to remember, God, we are not working for a victory this morning. We are working from a victory this morning, the victory over all sin and all death on the cross when you nailed our sins and trespasses there and you didn't stay dead. Oh, come on, church. You didn't stay dead. You only needed to borrow a tomb because you weren't going to be in it for long. And on the third day, you rose in power and you made everything subject to yourself. And now all authority has been given to you and you have commissioned us to boldly go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we are thankful we know you have won. Amen. Who's, who's glad to be on the winning team? Does anybody else like to win? Come on now. We're going to be in the book of Ephesians this morning, chapter 2, 10 verses. The title of this message is Back from the dead. Aren't you glad that Jesus brought you back to life? Amen. Anybody here been born again? You were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God who is so rich in mercy, why? Because of his great love for us, caused us to be made alive. Amen. I could, I could quote it to you this morning, but I'm going to read it. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 says this, and you were dead. Look at your neighbor and say, you were dead. Some of y'all still acting dead this morning. Somebody needs to remind you you're alive in Christ. Come on, somebody. And that's why you should always have your Bible, amen, because I know I could read this font, amen. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked, that's past tense, according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler who exercises authority over the lower heavens, and the spirit now working in the disobedient, we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. But God, my two favorite words in this passage, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. Together with Christ Jesus, he also raised us up and seated us in the heavens 
so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable, the immeasur immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift. Not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we could walk in them. Heavenly Father, help us all to walk in the good works that you saved us for and to no longer walk in the passions and desires of our flesh. Lord, you have saved us out of darkness and brought us into your marvelous light. Lord, you brought us back to life. You have brought us back from the dead. Now help us to live alive in Christ and to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. You can't be seated. Can we just give a big round of applause for Pastor DJ? He did a great job the last two weeks. He's filling in this morning, getting things, getting those pictures and words up on the screen for you. Thank you so much, Pastor DJ. We love you. He is the man you want with you when things get tough. Amen. amen. I got to say, we had a great vacation. It is so great to be back with you. We missed our church family here at Antioch Baptist Church, found a lovely little Baptist church all the way on the other side of the world in Penang, Malaysia, that we got to minister with, and that was great, but it wasn't home. How many of you like being in your home church this morning? I know I do. This morning we are in the book of Ephesians, and you have to remember as we, as, as we read this passage this morning where Paul is. Paul is on house arrest in Rome. He is a prisoner. He is chained to a Roman centurion, and here in this powerful little, little letter, he gives us one of the crown jewels, I think, of the entire New Testament. One of my favorite little short six-chapter books, the book of Ephesians, and it has a pattern in Ephesians that is similar to Romans, similar to some of his other letters, where he uses the beginning of the letter to give us the doctrinal explanation. The first three chapters of Ephesians are giving us a doctrinal explanation of the grace of God in which we have been saved. Amen. And then the last three chapters, he gives us how we live out that grace. The simple breakdown, chapters 1 through 3 of Ephesians, how you are saved. Chapters 3 through 6 tell us how the saved live. Amen. Amen. We're supposed to walk like Jesus walked. Now, Jesus died and rose again, amen, to bring all who believe back from the dead. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that's what the lost need. A lost and dying world needs the life of Christ. Lost people aren't just bad. The problem isn't that they are bad or that they are evil. The problem is they're dead. Spiritually dead. The gospel message is not primarily about good versus evil or right versus wrong. It primarily is all about life conquering death, life over death. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, come on somebody, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now you may have noticed it is Halloween season. Now this is, that's my least favorite holiday. I hate, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say hate. I, I, no, I do. I hate Halloween. I dislike it so strongly. I don't like it. It's all this dead stuff. You drive and people turn their front yards, you know, into a graveyard. You have skeletons and zombies and you have all this dead stuff walking around and, and acting like, like it's alive. And I, I don't like that. But the reality is that is real. That is life apart from Christ. Everyone apart from Christ truly is the walking dead. The world has been condemned already, John 3, 18. Everyone apart from Christ is dead and apart from salvation. Only Jesus brings that life and that eternal life. And that's Paul's passionate purpose in writing this letter to show that through Christ, all Jews and all Gentiles can be brought back from the dead and receive eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. When you call on Jesus as Lord and ask him to save you from your sins, he brings you back from the dead and gives you eternal life. And you become born again. Amen. Amen. And then we can say, as the Apostle Paul said, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. I've been born again, praise God. What does this back from the dead mean in regards to our salvation? Three simple things from these ten beautiful verses. The first is this. You were made alive 
in Christ. You were made alive in Christ. Verse 1 tells us, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were dead. Paul makes it clear here. The unsaved person is dead, disobedient, depraved, and doomed. Now there's a four-part free series right in the middle of point number one. You are dead, disobedient, depraved, and doomed. You don't need a self-help book this morning. You need eternal life. You don't need a life coach this morning. You need the life giver. Come on, somebody. Dead in trespasses and sins. Trespass here means your slips and your falls. How many times have you tried to make it and you just slipped and fell a little bit short? The Bible says that we have all sinned and have fallen short of God's glory. Sin here means to miss the mark. It's a term from archery. It means that you took your best aim at the target and you missed it. I remember several years ago I was in a tree stand and I was hunting and I'm, I'm such a serious hunter. You know, I had fallen asleep and I woke up. I was aggravated because I woke up. The squirrels playing in the trees had, had woke me up and then a turkey was talking. I'm like, I'm trying to get some sleep with y'all. Please be quiet. Well, then I looked and down and look, I'm telling you, like from me to, to where Brandon is, there is the, there's this this. This beautiful, beautiful, beautiful buck. And the problem was, is my when you sleep, you're not in a hunting position. So I'm, my, my bow is hanging. And so I'm trying to maneuver myself, and my knees are starting to shake, and I'm starting to get that buck fever, and I'm going, and I, I, get, that, I, get, that, I get that bow in my hands, and the buck looks up at me, and I'm looking at him. Maybe he'll think it's just leaves. I mean, it's all camo. And I, we're just, we're in a staring contest, and I know he's winning, and I'm just there. And I finally, I, I get that, he looks back down, I get that, I get that bow up, and I go, and he is right there, and I get that bow back, and you know what? I missed the shot. It was one of God's most perfect, beautiful hunting gifts. I've never had a shot like that. He was right there. I simply... Missed the mark. That's what it means to sin. No matter how good you try to be, you miss perfection. You miss God's righteousness. And a miss is a miss. I remember when Micah was pitching, it didn't matter whether he threw the ball over the catcher's head or whether it was just a half inch off of the outside corner. A miss is a miss, and they still called it what? A ball. We were dead. We were dead, unable to earn salvation, powerless. And helpless, this passage goes on to tell us in verses 1 and 2 that we are under the, the control, following the lead of Satan, the prince of the power of the air, the ruler who exercises authority over the lower heavens. We're following the lead of Satan. We're under the influence of this falling world, and we're trying to find fulfillment by fulfilling the, the sinful nature and fulfilling the desires of our flesh or our lust. And because of that sinful nature, it says here, that we were children of wrath, simply awaiting the day for judgment and punishment. But God, in verse 4, stepped in and intervened. Praise God. Who is rich in mercy because of his great love. What does it say? Made us alive with Christ. Love came down to rescue us. God wanted to save you this morning. Why? Because he loves you. Because you're his child. Because he wants to take away the sin that has separated you from him. That's why Jesus came. He made us alive when we confessed our sins and asked Jesus to save us and confess him as Lord of our life. The Holy Spirit touched my spirit and brought me back from the dead. He regenerated this dead, disobedient, depraved, and doomed son of Adam, praise God, and made me a child of God. Oh, that is so sad. Praise God. You should amen a little bit better than that. Amen. Born again. To live eternally with him. Seated in heavenly places. He took you out of the graveyard and he gave you a seat in the throne room. Come on, somebody. That's what that great theologian, the American dream, Dusty Rhodes used to say. He took you from the outhouse to the penthouse. Come on, somebody. He took you from eating from in, living in alleys, eating pork and beans, to whining and dining with kings and queens. He has made us his children. Praise God. No longer in the alley eating pork and beans. Now I'm dining with kings and queens. Praise God. Woo! Are you alive in here this morning? Somebody should give the Lord a praise for what he has done. He has made us 
alive in Christ. How? It tells us at the end of verse 5, by grace you have been saved. Being brought back from the dead means, first, that we are made alive by Christ. Secondly, point number two, it means that, by, that we are saved by grace. You were saved by grace. That's God's unmerited favor. It, grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Now, all the cheapskates in here should shout about that one. Some of y'all love a deal. You love a sale. You love to go yard. You will buy somebody else's junk, even though it is still junk. You think you're getting something great because you're getting it on the cheap. How about this for a bargain? How about this for a love sale? Christ takes all of your sin and then gives you all of God's grace. There is no greater deal in the universe. During a British conference that was being held in Great Britain on comparative religions, there were experts from all over the world, from all different religions. There were Buddhists and Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs and, and all different kinds of people. And they were all talking about the differences in religion. And they had finally come upon the topic of what made, if anything, what made Christianity unique and they were deliberating on this for several hours finally a, a, a man who was who was late to the to the conference late to the meeting you've probably heard of him his name was c.s lewis and so c.s lewis walks into this into this meeting and he says what is the current topic of discussion and they said we are trying to discover what is a distinction in christianity and c.s lewis said oh that is easy it's simply this grace by grace you have been saved. The Buddhist eightfold path, the Hindu doctrine of karma, the Jewish covenant, and the Muslim code of law, all they offer is a way to earn approval. Only Christianity declares that God's love is unconditional. He gives it to you free of charge. He gives it to you free of works, free of merit. There is nothing you can do to earn it. By grace, you and I have been saved amen. Amen. amen now how did he do it verses six and seven by grace through christ's death and resurrection paying the penalty for sin and jesus satisfying the wrath of god now god through christ can impute his righteousness to me and he can take me from being a wretched fallen dreadful sinner and make me into a child of god and then through the indwelling and ongoing work of his Holy Spirit with whom he seals me for the day of redemption and empowers me with his presence. Now I can live by grace and stay in that grace. But why did he do it? It goes on to tell us. God did it, it says here in verse 6, six and 7, to put his loving kindness on display for all the ages. In other words, you are in God's cosmic display case. Now, my wife loves to shop. Praise God. What a blessing. But due to the constraints of our monthly budget, many times we are restricted to window shopping. Anybody else like to just window shop oh it looks so good in the window and then even if you try it on and you look in their mirror it makes you look so good and then you get home and you're like great day i look like the, the side of a barn in this thing she loves the window shop and what retail companies like to do when you're walking by is they like to put some of their best sometimes most expensive items they put it on display in the front on a mannequin because they know you are more likely to buy it if you see it, because you see it on the mannequin and you say, man, that looks really good. And something in your brain goes, well, if it looks good on that, it must look good. It will probably look good on me. Now, there's a difference probably, you know, biologically and, and, and structurally between you and that mannequin. But you see it in the, in the display window and you go, man, that, that looks good. I, I want to buy it. It's just like when you, when you go to a new restaurant and you don't know what you're going to order from the menu. What do you do? Whatever picture they have, you go, that looks good. God saved us by his glorious grace in Christ to put the immeasurable riches of grace through his kindness on us 
on display for the whole world. You are in the front of the showroom showing the world that if God can save you, He can save anybody. You are on display. The question this morning is this. What are you reflecting? What are you displaying in your life? Are you showing the immeasurable riches of God's grace and kindness? Are you showing that southern sassy attitude? See, people need to see the richness of his grace. They don't need to see redneck ratchet from your life. Come on, somebody. You sweet southern ladies in here. And you sweet southern gentlemen with that razor sharp tongue where you'll say a hundred slanderous things about somebody Jesus Christ died on the cross for and then you'll follow it up and make yourself feel better by saying, but oh, bless their heart. Oh, but God love them. God's not only, God does love them. You're supposed to love them. And the way you love them is you are somebody who builds them up instead of tearing them down. Come on, somebody. God doesn't like ugly coming out of you because he saved you out of ugly so that you can walk in the beauty of his glorious grace. Come on, somebody. By grace, you have been saved. It says that we formerly walked in the desires of our flesh. Now we walk by the Spirit in the grace of God. You didn't earn it, and nobody can boast about it. It is not of works so that no one can boast. It is by grace through faith. Grace is the agent of your salvation. Faith is the avenue that that grace travels on. Grace is the source. Faith is the substance grace is the everlasting salvation and faith is the evidence of that salvation go back to hebrews chapter six it's not of works so that no one in this room can boast none of none of you are saved because you were good enough to be saved no one the person that has been cured of the disease who successfully goes through surgery the only thing they can boast about is the work and the skill of the physician come on somebody we can't boast in anything but in christ and christ alone and what he has done and yes for the we would you should also thank all those hard-working nurses that are doing the real work come on somebody amen but you didn't heal yourself all you did was go under for the procedure and it's the same way with salvation you cannot save yourself i remember when we were in orange we were members of the country town country town pool and i remember there was this group of teenagers and they were all messing around and this one teenage boy he could not swim well his friends didn't know that he was a bigger boy so a lot of them thought it would be funny if they would push him in to the deep end of the pool and they did and he starts drowning and he is flailing like crazy but he is sinking and going under and people are talking to the lifeguard the lifeguard did an amazing thing you know what she did she blew the whistle she cleared the pool out and then she got in the water and she stared at him. He's flailing and he's dying. And everybody's like, save him, save him, save him, save him. And that lifeguard is just calmly and confidently. I mean, just, just, just floating in that water, you know what I mean? Treading water, just waiting. It wasn't until that big teenage boy stopped altogether and started to sink. That's when the lifeguard went in and took him out. She got him out. He was saved. Everything was fine. They were asking her afterwards, why did you wait so long to save him? And she simply said, with the size of that boy, if I would have tried to save him while he was drowning and flailing, he would have killed both of us. I had to wait until he gave up, and then I saved him. And it's the same way with grace. You have to fully surrender. And you have to acknowledge and admit, God, I am powerless. I cannot save myself. I need you to save me. He brought us back from the dead by making us alive in Christ. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Point number three, why did he do it? You are saved for good works. It says in verse 10 that we are his creation, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. This word translated creation in the Holman Christian standard, it, the Greek word is the po- poemia. It's the Greek word for poem. In other words, you are handcrafted. You are God's masterpiece. You are his poem. God designed you and knit you together in your mother's womb. He created you on purpose 
for a purpose. Don't identify yourself with sin. Don't walk around confused about your identity. Don't identify yourself with your sexuality or with your habits. or with Identify yourself with the Creator that hand-formed you in your mother's womb and created you for good works to bring glory to His name. You are a work of art, handcrafted by God Himself, saved for good works. You are saved by grace for works. The reformer John Calvin said it this way. He said, it is faith alone that justifies, but faith that justifies will never be alone. I like that. You're saved by faith for works. We're not saved by faith plus good works. Amen? We are saved by a faith that works. Some of y'all need to get up off of your blessed assurance this morning and get back to doing work that brings glory to God the Father. Amen? Pastor Dave is back. Come on, somebody. Challenging you. And the great thing about doing these good works, anything done in the love of God for somebody else is a good work. I remember talking to a pastor's wife that would visit a nursing home, and she saw this older man who was so upset every time the meals would come around. And she asked the old man what was wrong, and he told her, he said, I'm upset because I'm a Jew and I can't eat any of this food and no one will listen to me. I've told them that I need a kosher diet and they, they, they ignore me and they keep bringing me this. So you know what she did? She started making him kosher meals and bringing them to the nursing home. It was as simple as a bowl of soup. And after several weeks of coming and visiting him and bringing him these meals, he finally asked, why are you doing this? You're not related to me. You don't know me. Why are you doing this? She said, I'm doing this simply because God loves you. And I want you to know Jesus, the Messiah died to save you from your sins. And I want you to experience his love. That's the kind of good works. Now, here's the thing. You have heard this said, and I have to tell you this morning, it sounds pretty. And it sounds nice, but it is 110% anti-Bible. You've heard it said, and it's been attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, although I don't think he actually said it, but that's who they credit it. He said, share the gospel whenever possible, and only use words if necessary. You ever heard that this morning? I'm here to tell you that's not what your Bible says. Salvation comes through hearing and hearing by the word of God. You have to use words, but what you have to make sure of, dear Christian, is that your works and your words match up. You had better talk that talk because it is the word of life that saves us, but then you had better match that talk with a Jesus walk. Saved by good works, what Jesus told us. Let your light shine before mankind so that they can see your good works. And glorify your Father who is in heaven. As the worship team comes, this morning God wants to bring us back from the dead. And I'm here to tell you this morning, God is so good at taking our worst pain and our most miserable moments and orchestrating them in such a way that there is purpose for the future from our pain. God can take the current miserable situation that you are in and he will work it out so that later on down the road there will be a good work prepared for you to do in obedience to him. And right now the agony and the pain may be blinding you. You may not understand why you are where you are, but I'm here to tell you if you just keep trusting him, he will bring purpose and beauty from those ashes. We've seen this in our own life. On May 29th in 2013, my wife, Laura, was rushed to the hospital for emergency surgery because the baby that she was carrying had gotten trapped in her fallopian tube and it was about to rupture. Now this would be Laura's second, our second atopic pregnancy. That was our sixth pregnancy loss. What made that so painful was because when we were praying, we felt so certainly that God had put it on our heart that she felt that God had told her, you are going to have a baby. You're going to be a mother. 
And so in the weeks before May 29th, she started spotting and started having complications. And the doctors and the OBs were like, well, you need to take care of this now. Just, just take the pill and flush your system out. And we were like, no, we're going to hold on. We're going to pray. We're going to believe. We had, had so many people fasting with us and praying with us. And we were up all night and we were praying and we were praying. But on the morning of the 29th, the, the pain was so intense. I put her in my car and I broke every traffic law from Orange County all the way to Martha Jefferson, and I got her in there just in time for them to take that tube and save her life. And we were devastated. I was angry at God. She was frustrated. She was hurt. We were confused. We're asking, why God? What glory do you get from a dead baby? What, we don't understand. Why in the world would you do this? this? This is mean. And we were reading, and we were praying, and we were getting comforted from our compassionate church family. We weren't feeling any comfort. Finally, we, we came to the point and we had to resolve, God, you are God and we are not. You don't owe us an explanation. We're going to serve you anyway and we're going to trust that you would bring beauty from those ashes. Five years later, we hosted a young man from Latvia and we were planning on adopting him. And then we found out that he had two half brothers and we said, okay, we'll just take them all. And then they changed the law right after we had paid for the international home study and we couldn't adopt them. We're devastated again. We're like, God, what in the world are you, are you doing here? It seems like you are just adding insult to our misery. We're trying to do a godly thing. Devastated again. We didn't understand. And then the Lord put India on my heart. I had been there several times. You had sent me several times. And so we went through the process and we, we changed the international destination, host country to India, and we, we started going through the paperwork. And in 2018, we were paired with Ezra. We went, and you know the story. I'm not going to rehash that whole story. We went with no return ticket. We went against people from this church, elders. People were, people were saying, don't go. It's stupid. Our adoption agency said we were crazy. We went anyway. We got him and we came back. Praise God. In the middle of the Delta variant. God did that. What broke Laura and I was when we finally received his Indian birth certificate. And we saw that the date of birth for Ezra was May 29th, 2013. This is what happened. Laura was in emergency surgery losing a child. Ezra was being born on the other side of the world. And six years later, we found out what Ephesians 2 chapter 10 means. That we are His workmanship, prepared to do good works beforehand. We didn't understand it. We could have never called it. It's not the way that we would have wrote it, but that was God's plan. All we had to do was trust him and walk in it. And I'm here to tell you, Antioch Baptist Church this morning, he's brought you back from the dead. He has saved you by his grace and he's called you for good works. And even when it gets hard and even when it feels miserable and even when you don't understand, you have to trust the one that knows the end from the beginning because he will write your story in a way that brings him the most eternal glory and draw more people to Jesus. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for the immeasurable richness of your grace. And Lord, I pray for those this morning that you're calling back from the dead. Lord, there's some in here, Lord, their hopes feel dead. Their faith feels dead. Some here... They're, they've never called on Jesus for salvation and their spirit is dead. I pray, oh Lord, that you would begin to breathe new life into them again. Help us to remember how we were saved and let us always remember why we were saved. Lord, you've made us alive in Christ. You've saved us by grace and you saved us for good works. Lord, do that work in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to respond to this message, let's stand on our feet. The altars and the invitation time is open. Seated above, toned in the Father's love. Destined to 
Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you that it's by grace that we have been saved. That it's not of work so that none of us can boast. And that we are God's workmanship. Created in Christ to do good works that you have prepared beforehand. Lord, help us to go out and remember, Lord, we were created on purpose for your purpose. Lord, help us to remember our great salvation rests solely, not on what we do, but on what you've done. And Lord, may the richness of your kindness shown to us because of your great love and mercy and grace through Christ. Lord, may that motivate us to let our light shine so that people can see our good deeds and glorify our Father who is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you. Go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ.